Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Life and Books and Everything as we begin a new season here in the first month of 2022. I'm your host, Kevin DeYoung. Good to be with you. And at the outset, let me do a few, a couple of housekeeping announcements, more than housekeeping, uh, some important tweaks to the podcast for this new episode. Uh, Not this episode, but this season. Uh, this podcast began during the pandemic as Justin Taylor, Colin Hansen, and myself were talking, and then I had the idea, well, we're talking all the time. Maybe it would be fun for us and possibly beneficial for others if we talked and let other people listen in. And as the podcast developed, and and I, I think it's grown, I hope, and uh, have listeners and we've had interviews. It's taken a little different shape uh, with a a lot of interviews, which I like to do. And one of the things, however, that's difficult with interviews is lining up all of the moving parts. And so you may have even noticed from last season that uh, Colin and Justin were in and out as it worked in their schedule. So it's not a, a major change from last season. But just to say at the outset of this season that what you're going to find is a little bit more of Life and Books and Everything hosted by Kevin DeYoung with occasional special guests, Colin and Justin. Uh, You can send all of your angry letters for that. Uh, There's no blood feud between us, among us. It's just it was very difficult to coordinate our three schedules anyways and then to line up interviews. So we have booked uh, several times throughout this season to have Colin and Justin on. So you will still hear the three of us bantering and talking about Midwestern cuisine and Big Ten sports. Uh, But most of the other episodes will be me interviewing various guests. So whether that's good news or bad news, that is the news. And that's how we're progressing with this season. And I'm really excited for the guests that we have lined up over the next 10 or 12 episodes. And Roughly, the cadence will be about every other week. Hey, you have lots of other things in your life. You do are not in desperate need to hear another podcast or hear from me every week or every day. So about every other week, we are. Uh, I am very glad to say that uh, the podcast is still sponsored by Crossway. Really grateful to work with them on a number of projects and to have them sponsoring This particular episode, I want to mention Sam Storm's new book, A Dozen Things God Did With Your Sin and Three Things He'll Never Do. This came out just uh, a week ago. So Sam talks about what God will never do, such as counting our sins against us, and then walks through the Bible's teaching and how we as believers can experience freedom and joy and peace and knowing what God has done. So you can pick up a copy of that wherever books are sold or visit crossway.org. And if you go to crossway.org slash plus, you can find out how you can get 30% off with a Crossway Plus account. So thank you, Crossway, for sponsoring Life and Books and everything. My guest for today is someone that uh, I've gotten to know uh well-ish over the past few months as we've communicated a lot uh, online and by text. And I'm sure we've met before, I think, but we 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 haven't properly, you know, got to, I won't say have a beer because I actually don't drink beer and uh, Andrew's a Baptist, so he may not either, <laughs> but whatever we would do to have a proper chin wag in person. Anyways, my guest uh, this episode is Andrew Walker. Andrew, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin, it's great to be with you. And I actually, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, we were on a panel together with uh, at CBMW at oh, the Gospel right. Coalition in 2016, perhaps. That was a different world. Yeah, different world. <laughs> the world so has changed. We have hung out before, but uh, I guess I guess we're becoming friends-ish. Yeah. Yes. So. No, it's very good. It's been great. Uh, so Andrew has uh, wears many hats upon his... Uh, his domed head, and uh, <laughs> which I can see, but you can't see. And uh, so he works now. His newest gig is managing editor of World Opinions, and 
to check that out. And I'm one of the columnists for that. Andrew's doing a great job there. And he uh, works a uh, full-time job at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us some of your background, your education, your family, and how many jobs you have now. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so uh, I, I grew up a uh, Midwestern kid in central Illinois and um, felt a call to ministry when I was 18, um, was converted when I was 15. And um, when you're 18 and you feel a call to ministry, you think that automatically means uh, the pastorate. And so I was kind of wrestling in undergrad when I went to Southwest Baptist University and, and did a degree in religion and biblical studies and um, was still wrestling with the pastorate and what that meant for me and really loved the academic side of things and had some, I guess, mild, mild or moderate success in it and thought, man, this could be fun to study theology and the Bible professionally. And uh, so then went off to Southern Seminary for my MDiv and then, um, again, was still wrestling with academia, the pastorate. Also, at the same time, I've always loved public policy culture, ethics, religion, kind of the the confluence of how all of these things interact in the public square. And um, a, a job kind of fell into my lap out of seminary to go work for an organization here in Kentucky that was kind of a, a Christian public policy type organization. And so got involved doing that, loved it. Um, and then from there, went to the Heritage Foundation and worked on marriage, life, religious liberty issues. And um, then from there, went to the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission for six years, worked on my PhD while I was there, and um, had an opportunity to come to Southern and took that opportunity, moved up here six weeks before COVID hit. So I had this mid-career change. Um, I'm, I'm learning what it means to, to balance a classroom, to teach a class, to manage a syllabus, and then COVID hits and we go online. So it was a strange, oh. it was a strange moment. But um, yeah, I love what I do here at Southern. I teach ethics, and um, we don't have a, a formal public theology program, but we have some public theology-oriented classes that I also teach as well. And so I just love it. I get to talk about the interaction of Christian faith with the world around us, and to be paid to do that and to teach is just a blessing that I, um, I can't take for granted. been married for 15 years to my wife, Christian, and we have three daughters— and my wife's a kindergarten teacher here in Louisville at our uh, classical Christian school where our kids go. And I'm a member of Highview Baptist Church where I teach uh, kind of a young adult class. So uh, that's kind of one part of my life. I'm also, as you mentioned, the managing editor for World Opinions, which is a brand new project and which, um, you know, is a substantive project, uh, which I'm enjoying doing because it, it's giving me the opportunity to both kind of do my academic gig and then also kind of keep one hand in the political news fray on a daily day-to-day -day basis. And then also I'm a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center under Ryan Anderson. He's been a longtime friend of mine. And when he became president there, he asked me to kind of be one of his uh, token evangelicals, uh, <laughs> yeah. predominantly Catholic. He's friendly to evangelicals, He's very friendly right? to evangelicals, yeah. Um, so I, I caused some trouble with him and kind of the uh, the evangelicals and Catholics together for for causing trouble in the public square type movement. Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, and uh, what was your PhD on? So I did my dissertation on the topic of religious liberty. And so um, I had a book come out May of 2021 mm -hmm. called Liberty for All, which is a much more reader-friendly version of my dissertation. And what I was kind of exploring, um, it, it kind of came about accidentally— uh, obviously, I was working at the Ethics and Religious Liberty at the time, um, and so did a paper on religious liberty and was really exploring how 20th century Protestants had conceived of religious liberty and really noticed kind of a lacuna in the literature that there were, were really no evangelical arguments um, to ground religious liberty in kind of distinctly systematic biblical categories. And so I kind of set forth uh, from that to kind of put up in skeletal frame, work form, how should we think of religious liberty as evangelicals? And is there anything intrinsic to the DNA of Christianity itself mm. that births something like religious liberty? And when you go and study the, the historical record, uh, religious liberty comes about from Christian thought. Tertullian, Lactantius, 
uh, early church, there are formulations or permutations of religious liberty, not like how we might conceive of it today, um, but the idea that individuals should be free at the level of their conscience and therefore uncoerced, that really does come about from Christianity. And so I think that there's the, the religious liberty is not merely a social construct. It's something mm-hmm. that does flow out of our Christian faith, but it's also something that we've refined as we've as Christianity has interacted in the world around it. Uh, do you find that, and we're, we're going to get to, just so our listeners know, uh, the main thing that Andrew and I are going to talk about uh, in a bit is natural law and natural theology. Mm-hmm. It's the interest of both of ours, and Andrew's doing some some work on that and has written some things on it, and it's an important topic, and it continues to be relevant for contemporary discussions, and there's a lot being written about it. So we're going to get there in, in just a moment, but I, I want to follow up on something you just said about religious liberty flowing out of Christian convictions do you do you sense that among let's just call them conservative Christians that religious liberty itself is being questioned we think of the the people that don't want to give evangelical Christians liberty of conscience when it comes to issues of sex or gender or marriage but mm-hmm. are you finding also from within our own tribe some people are suspicious of Christian liberty, like we should just go all the way and be Constantinian again? Yeah, I I think actually, you know, I wouldn't have said this three or four years ago, um, but I think that there definitely is a growing antipathy to religious liberty in conservative Protestant circles. And and let me say, a lot of the concerns that kind of the Christian reconstructionist, theonomist, kind of Protestant integralist crowd has, um, as far as their critiques concerning Western culture, I share a ton of those critiques. Um, I I don't think the solution then is to completely jettison or bypass the the basic liberty structure that we've established in kind of American context. But I mean, to the overarching sentiment, yes, there is, I think, a misunderstanding on the one hand that religious liberty is a form of kind of bland religious relativism, which is an inaccurate construal of religious liberty. But then I think at the pragmatic level, there's an attitude that says, in an ideal society, religious liberty would be good, but we're no longer in that ideal society. And religious liberty is now inviting in all of these cultural pathologies under the rubric of liberty. And so there's, in conservative Protestant circles right now, there is a big debate about what is liberty. Um, and I share the concerns of those individuals um, in, in wanting to recapture a more classical definition of liberty, which is the freedom to do what we ought, not simply what we want. Um, and so, that, I mean, that, that's going to bring us into the questions of the natural law uh, big time because it assumes teleology, uh, it assumes moral order uh, for you to have the basic foundations of a, of a working social order. And again, I share those critiques where society jettisons those overarching necessary um, shared telosses or teleologies. We are going to fragment into a thousand different voices where you really cease to have a nation. But what you really have are 360 million autonomous wills shooting off in whatever direction that they define as the good. And so this is the, the famous Anthony Kennedy, the myst- at the heart of mystery is the at the heart of liberty is the freedom to define your own existence. Um, he's kind of the high priest of expressive individualism. So I think the response to these challenges is, uh, in my book, I talk about, there's a section called Make Liberal Democracy Christian Again. Hmm. So I don't think we need to jettison liberal democracy, because if we jettison that, what we're doing is just trading various forms of illiberalisms back on top of each other. Um, and that's where you create systems where there's resentment, violence, uh, and just social conflict. And a a lot of this too is we need to readjust some of our expectations about what we hope to achieve in a fallen social order like our own. And I think when when you understand that contestability is just a reality of the world that we live in, you want to then build difference into the structure of the political system so that people who don't think like you aren't necessarily then driven to the margins 
or penalized or, you know, God forbid, acted with violence against. Right, right. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most important, maybe it is the most foundational truth for political philosophy, moral philosophy, is what you, whether you have an Augustinian view of the human mm-hmm. person. And certainly there's lots of things that are really important, but that's where you see things deviating very quickly. You see this, uh, of course, with Rousseau famously sees civilization as the corrupting force on mankind versus, uh, you know, it would be too far to say that, you know, Locke was a uh, reformed. He, he, yeah. he wasn't, and he had some heterodox views, uh, but there was certainly more of a pessimism about human nature. And you find mm-hmm. that in Madison, of course, Madison studied with my guy, John Witherspoon. So I, I am convinced that some of that reformed anthropology mm-hmm. did seep down into the founding fathers and finds its way into the formation of the constitution. <laughs> Uh, famous Federalist Paper 51 mm-hmm. is Madison arguing that ambition must be made to counteract ambition, that government must be somewhat frustrated by itself because the underlying assumption is uh, people are bound to do bad things. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, uh, I teach a, an elective course on the Enlightenment, and one of the things I just try to have people think about, and I'm not trying to say what their you know political ends should be, but there's there's two fundamentally different sort of questions we can ask with politics. One question is, what great things could we accomplish if all of us got together and in this thing called government or politics, we accomplish some great end? Well, that seems like, well, surely don't we want to do that? But the American founders really had a different set of, a different kind of question, and it was, what are all of the bad things that people could do and what sort of system in government would do best to try to frustrate those evil plans and the corrupting influence that power and ambition has upon us and our system? So I think understanding who we are as people and the the, the worst atrocities of the 20th century were people who at least ostensibly believed that utopia could be created on earth where the societies that have actually flourished and had uh, great growth and prosperity have been those, you know, generalizing by and large that have understood uh, what Thomas Sowell calls a constrained vision right. of the human person and what we can accomplish. So let's use this to segue into natural law natural theology. And we can circle back to some of those other issues in a moment, because this is not just a, it's a theological question to be sure. And I'm going to ask in a little bit to trace out what are some of the objections and why has this tradition very, very steeped, Mm -hmm. not just in Aquinas or medieval scholasticism, but in Protestant scholasticism and in the Protestant tradition from the very beginning, from the very beginning in the 16th century, and what happened that it has become yeah, sure. suspect. But let's start with some definitions. Uh, natural law, natural theology, overlapping, but not identical terms. So what do we mean? What's a generic definition of natural law? So, I mean, I think that there are um, effectively, you know, perhaps four components to a natural law definition. One would be the question of origins. So it, is there a natural law? Where does it come from? So then, then you have this question of substance. What is it? What comprises the natural law? Then you have an issue of epistemology and knowability. So then how do we grasp it? And then I think fourth, there's this apologetical question of why deploy natural law? And I actually think later on, I'd love to hit on the question of the why of natural law, because I think I think Reformed Protestants have a misunderstanding at the level of apologetic, which then problematically shapes how we respond to the idea of the natural law. But if you're thinking through the natural law, um, if I lay out those broad contours, um, we would say natural law uh, is rooted in the eternal law of God, the eternal reason of God. 
Um, God orders a universe where there are moral principles that in principle can be grasped by all persons um, through acts of reason. Um, and that the way we understand moral good is through reason grasping the fact that there are non-instrumental um, reasons for acting. So the fact that life is a basic good, that you woke up today, Kevin, you had breakfast, you might exercise at some point today. Um, we've established that life is a good. So if we establish that life is a good by, by use of our practical reason, from that we then develop norms and principles to order our life to facilitate and achieve those particular goods. And there's, there's debates in natural law theory about what are all of those various goods. Um, so then there's a question of how do we know the natural law? So again, that's, that's reason, that's conscience. Uh, the, the famous language, the, the locus classicus is Romans 2, 14 and 15, the law written on the heart that God implants on it. In kind of the Thomistic tradition, the law written on the heart is believed to be what, the, what they call the first principle of practical reason, which is we are to pursue good and avoid evil. Um, that's, that's what we call an indemonstrable or self-evident truth that we then build all other moral truths off of. Uh, and then utility. Why do we deploy it? I think to me, we deploy it not primarily as an apologetical enterprise to persuade non-believers. That's if, if we start there from the presupposition of why we deploy it, we then can rightfully fall victim to, uh, or, or we, can, we can devalue the impact of sin on reason. And so I'm, I'm a reformed Calvinist who is also a natural lawyer, and so I have to simultaneously say the natural law exists, but also sin has impacted reason. But I think the way that some Calvinists talk about reason and the natural law is we, we don't talk about it in very clear categories. Um, and so you see this in, in Carl F. H. Henry's writings on the natural law. And I, I love Henry. He's one of my heroes. But I think he completely misunderstands the natural law. And the, one of the reasons he misunderstands it is he substitutes the term natural law for another term called creation ethic. Because even mm. Henry understands if non-believers have even basic moral min, min, minimal moral knowledge, they're operating on the grounds of the natural law. And 99.99% of Americans are going to go to bed tonight without having murdered each other. So the fact that there is an intuitive grasp on the principle of life as a good, and people are then acting to preserve life, well, from the ultimate perspective of the eternal law, you have rational creatures participating in the eternal law. And that's, that's, the, that's the definition Aquinas proffers. It's the rational agents or the creaturely agents participation in the eternal law. That's natural law. That's good. No, it's really good. And I like those, uh, just to, to highlight, you said origin, substance, epistemology, and then utility, or how yeah. do we use it? Those are four good categories. Uh, my simple definition, which, which coheres with that, uh, natural law refers to the rule of right and wrong implanted by God mm -hmm. in the minds of all people. So yep. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Sometimes, just if you're reading the literature, uh, especially older literature, sometimes called law of nature, law of nations, the divine law, the eternal law. It is important to remember we're talking about God's law. So Absolutely. natural law doesn't mean it's the law of nature apart from God. Sometimes that you know we can use nature, but it it's divine. It's God's law, and the conscience mm -hmm. bears witness to it. So the Ten Commandments traditionally are seen as a divinely revealed summary of the law of nature. Uh, so the law of nature or natural law refers to this idea that there's something implanted within us, and you talk about epistemology, so that's another question in a moment, how we can know it. But there, there is a uh, there is something that can be known about how God wishes his creatures to conduct themselves mm -hmm. that does not require special revelation. Of course, special revelation 
is clearer. Special mm -hmm. revelation is necessary in order to be saved. Special revelation will help us see more clearly what is there in natural law. Mm -hmm. But even apart from special revelation, there are things mm -hmm. that can be known. And here in Reformed theology, they make distinctions sometimes between, uh, you know, Turretin says this, Pictet, they'll say what is uh, innate and acquired. So mm -hmm. there are certain things right. that can be known that are innate, that sense of divinity, that seed of the divine that Calvin calls it, uh, the conscience. There are things innate, and then there are things acquired by observing the rational universe, by observing uh, God's acts of providence. They believe that there were things that you could know, and that's getting here into what natural theology. So why don't you say a little bit, Andrew, because obviously they're related, Yeah. but how is natural theology different, and what is your definition there? So, I mean, there's a lot of confusion about the term natural theology in reform circles, and so let me, let me kind of remove the problematic way of thinking about natural theology. The caricature of natural theology is kind of a hyper-reformed critique of Aquinas that mm -hmm. says Aquinas believes that someone can reason themselves with tremendous certainty to a full knowledge of God. Um, what Aquinas is saying is that, no, it's not a full knowledge of God, because full knowledge of God is revelatory. And Aquinas actually talks about the need for revelation, divine revelation, to clarify the full nature of God. Aquinas says that there is um, this in innate knowledge that individuals understand God as creator. They don't necessarily understand God as redeemer. So the question mm -hmm. then becomes, how has God instilled or instantiated knowledge of himself in the world around him? And here, you know, I, I would say you, you would point to um, Romans chapter 1, there's, a, there's an innate knowledge of um, our design, bodily design, um, creational design. Uh, we might point to the law of consequences, the law of conscience, that there is some voice that is telling us that we're wrong when we overstep a moral boundary. When mm -hmm. There's this sense of we, we feel like we have violated some rule. Well, what is that rule? Well, it, it's a moral law, but again, that moral law is rooted in God. But then I would say more than that, I mean, Psalm 19, Psalm 19 for natural theology is the locus classicus. And I actually just over the weekend was doing some, some research on this and um, had my mind, quite frankly, blown. Um, when you go to the first parts of Psalm 19, God is mentioned as El, which is the, the, the creational concept of God. And then in the latter part of Psalm 19, it's the covenantal name of God, Yahweh. And so when, when the psalmist, David, is talking about uh, creation, he's saying that creation pours forth divine speech. It, it pours forth design. There's intelligibility that individuals, by looking to mm -hmm. creation, orderliness, design, they grasp the idea that there must be a creator to this creation. And again, that's, that's not the covenantal God. That's this understanding of God the creator. You go down sequentially in Psalm 19, it then begins, it begins to get more particularized and narrow that the psalmist understands that this creator God is the God who gave the law, the divine revelation that particularizes and, and, and offers granular detail on the, on, the, on the fullness of that law to Israel. Israel is then that divine carrier of God's divine law. And then in the last part of Psalm 19, David is referring to the law's impact on himself. So I, I feel like there's this, this very nice device where we're observing the law go from, from general to specific. Yeah, and, and theologians will sometimes, and you mentioned it there, the two things, that in natural, by natural theology, one can know that there is a creator, uh, Romans 1, and you can know his eternal power and divine attributes. And depending on which Reformed theologian you read, some of them, like Benedict Pictet, he gives quite a lengthy paragraph of all the things he thinks mm. we can know. Sure. Others have a shorter list. But really, this is this is consistent uh, throughout the Reformed tradition, 
and through old Princeton. Uh, I don't know if people would have access to it, but I did an article that came out a few months ago in the Westminster Theological Journal about this and going back and forth uh, in, a, in a charitable way, I hope, with another author and just talking about natural theology and whether we can acquire true theology apart from special revelation. Not saving. I mean, every reform theology are always clear. It's not saving. It's not sufficient for that. It's not sufficient mm -hmm. to know Christ as Redeemer, but to know true things about God. And your point about Aquinas is really important because that's often the, well, you're a, you're a closet Roman Catholic right. because you said something <laughs> right. nice about Aquinas. Uh, no, actually, if you go back and read, you know, the famous five proofs or five ways, that's what uh, Aquinas is often known for in our circles, the, the proofs for God's existence. He calls them five ways. And he actually starts with Exodus 3.14. I am the God. I am that I am. So Aquinas doesn't argue that, all right, I'm sort of Rene Descartes style, who right. of course is later. Uh, I'm just going to think myself empty. And now I'm going to build my way up to believe and know that there's a God and I can convince you a God and th that there's a God and that there's it's the Christian God. No, he says God is self-existent. God is that he is. But here are five ways. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you could argue philosophically, are those still convincing ways or not? I think there's some, some are better than others. But Turretin, for example, really the high point of reformed, post-Reformation reform dogmatics, he has his own four proofs mm -hmm. for the existence of God, which are quite similar to Aquinas's. Uh, William Shedd into the 19th century as five principal arguments for God's existence. So none of these theologians were thinking, we have emptied ourselves, and now we start by reason alone, and we work up to the Christian faith. Well, and Go ahead. I, yeah, I'd like to speak to that, because, I mean, the, the question we ought to ask as Reformed Protestants is, is not, did Aquinas say it, therefore it's suspect. It, the question is, did the, does Scripture reveal this? And yes, I mean, to, to your point, and what I try to tell my classes till I'm blue in the face is reformed rejection of natural law is a 20th century phenomenon. But prior to that, it's everywhere in the reformed tradition, speaking to this reality that, that man has some type of innate knowledge. Calvin refers to it as the census divinatus. Right. Um, but then you go look in scripture, and um, I'm telling you, when you go looking for the natural law in Scripture, it then begins to show up everywhere. So in Deuteronomy chapter 4, there's language about God gave Israel the statutes of the law that is good, but then it says uh, in verse 6 or 7 of chapter 4 that the nations will see that the Lord is good and that his law is good. Well, that presupposes that the surrounding nations have legitimate moral knowledge to know that the law is actually good, and that what Israel testifies to is actually good. Um, you go to Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20. He says to Abraham, why have you done things that ought not be done? How does a pagan king understand that some type of principle of justice has been violated? And, and that's, that's what we're getting to with natural theology. Yeah, uh, Archibald Alexander, the... Uh, Genesis there of Old Princeton, first professor, says, Natural theology, quote, consists in the knowledge of those truths concerning the being and attributes of God, the principles of human duty, and the expectation of a future state derived from reason alone. And many of these theologians, you're absolutely right, most important is not Aquinas, not even our own Reformed tradition, or the Westminster Confession, which distinguishes between the knowledge that comes from the word and the knowledge that comes from the light of nature. All these are important. We, we belong to a tradition, but ultimately it's, well, what does scripture teach? Mm -hmm. And w a couple of the passages that uh, our theological forefathers would go to all the time, you mentioned, we can talk about Romans 1, Romans 2, Psalm 19, but also Acts 14 and Acts 17. Yep. When, when Paul, we can see when he's preaching to Jews and they have a certain shared epistemological foundation. He's going to talk about their shared history as God's people and as Hebrews and Israelites. But with others, he's going to 
reference one of their poets. He's going to talk about creation. He's finding something mm -hmm. that is uh, a kind of commonplace. Now, he's he's not saying that from that you can reason your way and let's not have scripture play any role, but all through the Reformed tradition, and you said it very well, uh, until relatively recently, 20th century, there is an understanding that there is revealed religion and there is reasoned religion, or there is natural theology and supernatural theology. And of course, supernatural theology is far, far superior, and we need it in order to be saved. And I teach systematic theology, and it's a course on that revealed religion, what, what God has revealed to us in the scriptures. But there's another kind of revelation, general revelation, what we see in creation, what, what can be known by the, the works of providence through observation. And through this means, there, there are things that can be known. And so, you know, sometimes they get dinged. I'm just thinking of, you know, we always, the danger with doing a PhD, you always want to talk of, about it and no one wants to listen to it. But if I can just mention John Witherspoon, uh, much of the secondary literature, and even from really esteemed, you know, historians, uh, Noel and Marsden and others, Will, will ding him and say, well, look here in his lectures on moral philosophy, he's really imbibed this completely enlightenment idea. He's too indebted to Francis Hutcheson and others. And he has this, uh, he, he's now become just an enlightenment philosopher because he's talking in these reason sort of terms. But if you read carefully what he's saying, he's doing nothing different mm -hmm. than his reform forefathers did for the two centuries prior. And that is to say, in this category of moral philosophy, we're dealing with what can be known yeah. by reason. And we may argue that he thought you could know too much or there were mistakes, but just the category itself was so widely shared and assumed that it didn't mm -hmm. even need to be argued for. So something that was um, pointed out to me, and I honestly, I forget where I read it now at this point because it all bleeds together, but something I read one, po one time pointed out that when Paul is indicting the audience in Romans chapter 1, he's not indicting them for how little they know. He's indicting them for how much they know. Mm. So there is that innate yeah. knowledge. But then obviously, there's this. they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I, I find when talking about the natural law and reformed circles, um, it requires as much removal of caricature as it does proper theological and biblical formulation of the category itself. Because as I mentioned, like with Henry, Henry substitutes natural law for creation ethic. Then other traditions might refer to it as an order of creation in the Lutheran worldview. Um, you might have uh, common grace in some sense, kind of the neo-Calvinist tradition. Uh, it's, and then general revelation as well. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole swirling sub, uh, subset of terms that are all dancing around this notion that innate moral knowledge exists. And a lot of the reason that people don't like the natural law is because they just associate it with Roman Catholicism. And in fact, I almost did my dissertation on Carl Henry and the natural law. And then kind of as I was considering it, didn't think that there was enough there to do a full dissertation on. But in the process, I had a conversation with Dr. Richard Land, who is a, he was a close friend of Dr. Henry. And I said to Dr. Land at a meeting one time, I said, Dr. Land, I've been reading Henry on the natural law. And, and Dr. Land, by the way, is, is pro-natural law. And I said, it's, it's, as I'm seeing Henry, Henry is making arguments for the natural law without using the terminology of natural law. And Dr. Land bellowed in his like classical big laughter. And he said, well, of course that's the case. Carl Henry was a post-Vatican II anti-Catholic. He wouldn't let our language play on their terms. And mm. so, of course, he's going to find different language to use. All right, let's transition our discussion just a little bit. And we've already hinted at some of the objections that people may have to using natural law or arguing according to natural theology. So, Andrew, talk about what what is the correct way or what are some of the good ways we should use and think like natural lawyers and what are some dangers we should avoid? Well, I think one of the things we want to do is to 
first and foremost, move away from thinking about natural law as primarily an apologetical tool. It's never less than an apologetical tool, but it's something more than that. And I think when we talk about this, how we conceive of it and, and frame it up is is really, really important because I find in my circles that I move in, when you hear natural law, you often think about, oh, well, this is how we convince non-believers to become persuaded by our public ethics. Um, I think that's possible, but I don't think that that's necessarily likely all the time. In my view, we ought to be discussing natural law in the context of its explanatory power, uh, in terms of it giving rational explanation uh, or rational articulation of those norms that we think God has implanted within the created order. So for that, it means, again, um, explanation of those norms. I think it means exposing the errors of secular morality. And I think, quite frankly, in our culture, if we can't persuade someone, something that we can do is at least have people maybe be a little less strident in the confidence that they have in their convictions and realize, oh, hey, these Christian natural law convictions, they're not they're not simply sectarian or fideistic. Um, and then, I, I, you know, honestly, it's an issue of discipleship. Um, if we're thinking about um, in this context that we're in right now in this culture around issues of gender and sexuality, I don't know how our people in the pews can have conversations with people in their workspace without having to employ categories adjacent to the natural law, which means before they are engaging in those conversations outside, there has to be catechesis within. So that means them understanding that uh, there's a relationship between general revelation and special revelation, and that when the Bible is giving an, a, a portrait of what it means to be male and female, uh, we go to Genesis chapter one, and we see that God made male and female in his image. Um, and so tied to that image then is the ability for them to reproduce. So um, male and female, he made them in his image, uh, get married, multiply, exercise dominion. Okay, so that's actually a natural law argument. Tied to our definition of male and female, it are their capacities for reproduction. And what we know is if you begin to construct definitions of male and female off of those biological immutable categories, you jettison sound, rational, or even coherent understandings of male and female. Yeah, that's right. I mean, one was it, it's increasingly hard in our day for people to simply explain what is a man or a woman. And you see this all the time. And there's more to say, but there's not less to say than to start with a man is someone who, again, if all the plumbing is working correctly, is able to sire children. And a woman is someone, again, who, if all is working correctly, is able to incubate human life, a womb man. And you see this in Genesis. It's wonderful how it works with the Hebrew that she shall be called Isha, for she was taken out of Ish. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. It's nice that there's something of an English parallel there with the words. And of course, we see more clearly from scripture. But to your point, I agree entirely. These natural law arguments help to sustain and inform our faith. The, the caricatures are that we just strip ourselves empty of any other ideas and we just argue from the ground up and there we've convinced somebody of it. Yeah, that that won't often work. Now, it's true in the public square, we should use the Bible. And at other times, we should use these sort of natural law arguments, which may have a little more immediate purchase power for people. I think of the expression I've heard Greg Kokel use, putting a pebble in someone's shoe. That's often right. what you're doing with evangelism or putting in a good word for Christ or giving these sort of rational explanations. You're not expecting that someone says, wow, I've never thought of that. I think abortion is wrong. I'm going to change my mind on gay marriage. I believe Jesus rose again from the dead. But they may walk away, and though in that moment they don't give any credence to what you're saying, they think about it, they ruminate on it, and it's like that pebble in the shoe. Eventually, you stop and you bend over and you say, okay, enough is enough. What is here in my shoe? And they maybe need to think about mm -hmm. it a little bit more. 
say a little bit more, Andrew. Let's talk about some specifics. And in our culture, that means a lot of discussion about sex, gender, marriage. We've already hit on that a little bit. How do you think some of these natural law arguments, reasonings can help bolster our faith? Because one of the things you and I have talked about before is, and you just mentioned it, discipleship, catechesis. Uh, I've said before that I think we do a fairly good job in the church of giving people the correct conclusions on these controversial matters, but we don't often give the superstructure that helps them reach these conclusions. So they know, mm-hmm. oh, I'm not just believing this because as an act of the will, I ought to believe this, but because there are really good metaphysical, morally philosophical reasons to support what we see in scripture. How do we think like that with some of these hot button issues? Well, I mean, I think, like you said, we want to go to the superstructure. And so the superstructure says um, a Christian view of reality doesn't divide reality up into a Christian interpretation of reality and then reality over here. There is one reality. It is God's world. We are living in it. And so that has a massive implication for secular ethics. It means that secular ethics, insofar as they jettison special revelation and they jettison general revelation, they're jettisoning sound, coherent, rational principles just in themselves. Um, But when you get to the issue of something like marriage, we know from scripture that marriage is given as a creational ordinance in Genesis chapter one. We understand the redemptive significance of marriage uh, and the Christ church union and and, and that imaging that reality Um, But tied to marriage in Genesis chapter one is not just the capacity for procreation. There's something prior to that, which is the whole notion of complementarity, that complementarity makes procreation possible. And so if we're if we're taking marriage all the way back to the beginning and complementarity is tied into the definition of it, if you remove complementarity from our understanding of marriage as our society has done. You then remove the principle from the definition of marriage that would keep marriage to be principally limited to only two persons uh, and and something that's assumed to be a permanent, exclusive, um, monogamous union. And we're seeing that right now play out. Um, You know, a, a lot of Seculars, uh, secularists and progressives were saying, oh, you social conservatives and you Christians, you're just fear mongering over this over this gay marriage issue. Uh, no one's actually arguing for plural marriage. That's not the case. We actually know that's happening right now in several jurisdictions. No, that took like a minute before that happened. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, it, it, they were saying, well, no, you're engaging in a slippery slope argument. And we're saying, well, actually, the slopes turn out to be really, really slippery because the, the slopes are dependent upon logic. And if you remove complementarity from the, the foundational superstructure of marriage, you're playing fast and loose with the intelligibility of the overall institution. And so now you have jurisdictions in Massachusetts that are actually arguing for reciprocal marital like um, legal exchanges for polyamorous couples. And the social conservatives and the Christians are sitting back and basically saying, we told you so. Um, so again, if you remove complementarity, you remove the superstructure of of it all together. And then if you go to something like the sanctity of human life, um, this is actually one of the more simpler arguments, I think, is uh, mm-hmm. every single human being began as an embryo, began as an unborn child. So the question then becomes, why do we bestow rights and personhood only when a child passes through the birth the birthing canal. Well, that's what secularists do. That's not what Christians do. And so when you then measure human dignity and the ascription of human rights to the size, the development, um, the environment that the, the unborn child is in, um, you then begin to put human rights and human dignity on a sliding scale. And so for us as Christians, we want to say, no, the principle of dignity means that dignity begins the minute contracept or not contraception conception begins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> big, di- big difference right there. Big difference. Yeah. So, so from the moment of conception, uh, we would say as Christians, human dignity um, and the image of God inheres 
within that intrinsically. And so from there, that's where we begin to ascribe this notion of rights. Um, secularists don't do that. Um, that's why, again, you have this sliding scale understanding of, of where to assign those realities. Yeah, and that's so right, because we are biologically, organically, the same being that we were from that moment when the sperm penetrates the, the egg and right. personhood adheres there. That that's makes the most sense with biology. Now, that's a religious claim, you could say, on one level, but it's also a biological, philosophical claim. And you, you talk about marriage, too. Uh, and when you say complementarity, we would both be complementarians in the theological sense of men's and women's roles. But but you're meaning something even a little less than that. You're simply meaning right. men and women were created, man and woman, male and female, created as a complementary pair. So that we know from Genesis, the the side of the man, the rib, forms woman. So that when Adam and Eve come together, it's not just a union, but in a profound way, a reunion of the man and the woman, each fit for each other. The reason that she was a helpmate, you know, look around, Adam, why why couldn't have Adam, why couldn't God have created a bunch of buddies for Adam? A lot of guys would say, I'd love just a, a, a man cave with a bunch of buddies. Why couldn't he have had companionship with a, a golden retriever, man's best friend? No, it was because it wasn't chiefly companionship, but that's special. That's, you know, wonderful. But the woman was a helpmate for the husband because only the man with the woman could fulfill that creation mandate you talked about. That is to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. So you think about a conjugal view of marriage. Marriage is that arrangement by which human life is formed. What does it mean to, to have a one flesh union? Uh, why is it that when you hold hands with someone, that doesn't constitute marriage? Or you give somebody a wet willy or you stick their finger up their nose. We don't <laughs> think that's a, a one flesh union. Why? Because a one flesh union is emotionally, biologically one with a telos, meaning it, it comes together for a singular, for a biological function. That's not all marriage is, but you don't have marriage without that without the two sorts of persons who, again, if all of the, the plumbing were working, form that sort of one flesh union. That's that's what it is. Yeah, I, I, I affirm absolutely all of that. So so we go from gender, sexuality, the issue of human dignity. Um, and I've mentioned human rights already, um, but you can't get at a coherent understanding of human rights, which everyone you know, wants to believe in and subscribe to in our society, you can't get to a, a clear, principled, inviolable doctrine of human rights apart from the natural law. And again, we would say that's a natural law rooted in the eternal law. Um, there's there's a famous quote from one of the drafting members uh, who wrote the Universal Declaration on Human Rights from the UN in 1948. And one of the drafting committee members said to a journalist, we are unanimous about these rights on the condition that no one asks why. <laughs> and I think that's honestly one of the most telling quotes that society can, can admit about itself. Again, that speaks to the universality of the natural law. There's this longing for wholeness. There's a longing for justice. There's a longing for truth. Um, we would say that that is... Um, a facet of natural theology, um, but Christianity goes one step further and says, uh, in, 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 in much the same way that Paul does in Acts 17, this longing for right. rights to the, to the unknown deistic social justice God of, of human rights, Christians say that God has become flesh. His name is Jesus Christ. And so that's why we always want to go back to this reality that, uh, Special revelation and general revelation are not at odds. Special revelation particularizes and makes more granular uh, the universal longing for rights and justice. And think about 1 Corinthians 11, and admittedly, there's some cultural element to it. That's what makes these discussions difficult at times. But when Paul says, does not nature itself teach you? 
that it is shameful for a woman to pray with her her head uncovered. We can talk about what exactly was the covering, and it was some sort of symbolic representation in that culture of of masculinity and femininity and of proper sexual discretion. But Paul uses an argument to say nature teaches us something. There, there, a lot of people talk ill about the you know the so-called gag reflex or the yuck reflex, and that's true. That can be overdone, and it's not foolproof. But there is something that Paul is saying. Nature teaches you that the confusion of male for female—that's the underlying argument. That that itself is shameful. Now, yes, it's true. Culture is at times going to give us what some of those cues look like. But we're kidding ourselves, even with the explosion of the people identifying as trans, we're kidding ourselves if we don't think there's still a sense we have of men are not women and women are not men. Because when Bruce Jenner wants to become Caitlyn Jenner, he doesn't just walk out looking like Bruce Jenner. He comes out looking this very feminine form because there's something that a woman is, even if we've so confused it that we now think by an internal sense of our own identity, we're male or female. Yet we realize that as that comes on the other side, this is why people are, the, you know, the tragedy of puberty blockers for young kids and surgeries, because people understand that there actually is an isness to being a male mm. or female. Let, let me... Uh, you're so gracious to give us this time. Let's end here. Talk about some resources. By all means, mention anything you've written or you're working on, articles, mm -hmm. books, authors. Just as we close, give our listeners, if they want to read more, where should they go? Sure. So I, I write quite a bit about um, natural law and its connection to religious liberty in my book, Liberty for All. There's there's quite a bit in there. And then I've done quite a few essays on this subject at Public Discourse. First things, uh, I'm actually working right now on, um, it's an evangelical natural law ethics primer that will be coming out through BNH, BNH Academic. I'm still writing it, so it's still a, a, a ways out until it's going to see book, uh, bookshelves. But other books I'd recommend, um, David Van Drunen's work, just generally speaking, Politics After Christendom. He has a book, The Biblical Case for Natural Law. Uh, his volume, Divine Covenants and Moral Order. I think might be the most modern day magisterial treatment of natural law from a reform perspective. Uh, Andrew Haynes and David Fulford's volume from the Davenant Institute on natural law is very helpful. Uh, any work by Jay Budachevsky, I would also encourage you to pick up. And then the works of Robert George, um, whether that's mm -hmm. generic articles you can find of his online or his more popular volumes, volumes like uh, Clash of Orthodoxies, or, or his more technical volumes, like Indivents of the Natural Law. They take some time to get through because um, they're academic, but they are accessible. Um, and then I would say going backwards, well, go to, um, there's a, a, a recent volume, 2006, it's not that recent, from Stephen Grable, Rediscovering mm. the Natural Law and Reformed Theological Ethics, which is now being looked to in, in the field and scholarship of natural law theory as a real... Um, major hinge upon which the retrieval of natural law is happening in reform circles. Uh, you know, Grable's book goes back and looks at Peter Martyr Vermigli, John Calvin, Martin Luther, uh, Francis Turretin. We have other reformers like Althusius, Niels Hemmingsen, uh, Jerome Zanchi. Uh, again, you, if you go looking through the reform tradition, natural law is everywhere. Um, so just any of these resources would be good places to start. That's great. And in particular, the Grable book uh, published by Erdman's, it looks very daunting, but there are over 100 pages of in notes and index. So it's less than 200 pages of text. I think it was his dissertation, but it's it's very good. Uh, the new book, uh, did you mention Natural Theology, A Biblical and Historical Introduction and Defense by David Haynes, also Davenant Guides. David teaches Philosophy and Theology at Bethlehem College and Seminary. So this is one of my top 10 books of last year. Very readable and good survey of the biblical defense and historical introduction. And then also you mentioned earlier, just in passing, Niels Hemmingson on the law of nature, a demonstrative method. So this is an older 16th century Lutheran work. So mm -hmm. it it's 
it's not easy reading, but uh, whenever we can to go back to these earlier sources, we're well served. And uh, thanks to E.J. Hutchinson, Corey Moss, both professors at Hillsdale who are, who put this out, translated, edited, introduced, and they're doing good work. Uh, just one other book, and you can get this relatively inexpensively on Amazon or elsewhere, Moral Philosophy in 18th Century Britain, God, Self, and Other by Colin Haidt. That's a new book that talks a lot about the natural law tradition and someone we haven't mentioned yet, Samuel Puffendorf, one of the great names of uh, <laughs> moral philosophy. Everyone was working from Puffendorfian assumptions after Puffendorf, whether to tweak it or to continue it. But there's very much this natural law assumption, both Protestant and Catholic. And it comes down in really important ways to the American founding. So there's lots of good stuff out there and encourage people to look for your stuff, to read your articles, to to Google Andrew Walker and natural law. And, and Robbie George, of course, is is, is uh, usually very good and readable as well. Andrew, thank you so much for being here and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation in person and maybe having you back. So until next time, all of our loyal listeners, glorify God, enjoy him forever and read a good book. <laughs>